Praise the Lord, everybody, and welcome to the Scripture Cathedral. Uh, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. It is good to be back in the house of the Lord one more time because I realize it could have been the other way, but God has allowed me to see another day, and for that I am thankful. Um, on last Sunday was Youth Day, and we had a good time. Um, we had two young people to speak on Sunday, and um, they did such a fine job that I might get them to speak this Sunday. No. <laughs> but they did an excellent job. And I'm, I'm, I'm the type of pastor that I like to push my young people. I like to back them up because they are our future, they are the next generation. And I want to um, say to Minister Saudi, thank you for the job you're doing with our young people. And to Sister Alicia, thank you for the job that you're doing with our young people. Um, this coming Sunday at 11 a.m. right here at the Scripture Cathedral, uh, 7610 Central Avenue in Landover, Maryland, at 11 o'clock this Sunday, we will have Miracle Communion. Uh, so make sure you're here and you're here on time. Um, I know that we've been uh, downgraded as far as the percentage of capacity that we can have, but I think we're okay because we have another room that we use. So make sure you're here. And don't get upset if you have to sit in the, the, the fellowship hall. You need to get here on time. Then you can be in the service. Um, so make sure you're here at 11 a.m. Sunday. If you need information or direction uh, or anything you want to know about the Scripture Cathedral, you can uh, go to our website, which is www.scm.church. Or you can dial in 202-333-5300. If you get an answering service, uh, go to extension 202. Tonight, I'm going to talk about something I think that needs to be talked about because it is indeed happening in the church today. Um, a lot of people, especially during this pandemic, a lot of church people, a lot of saints of God have lost some zeal. And uh, it bothers me as a, as a pastor to see um, what is happening to some of our Christian brothers and sisters. And when I'm talking, I'm not talking uh, just about Scripture Cathedral. I'm talking about the Christendom, the whole world what's happening in the church. Let me start off with this statement. Lukewarmness hurts the church more than coldness does. No one points to a godless pagan person and say, I cannot become a Christian because of him. But people have always pointed at a half-hearted Christian of the church and say, why should I become a Christian? I am as good as they are or even better. We might be satisfied with our spiritual lukewarmness, but the Lord is not. Uh, such was the condition of the Laodicean church. Um, we make Christ sick when the church is lukewarm. And the only way to fix it is we have to repent. So tonight, let's focus on lukewarm Christians. Lukewarm Christians. What is lukewarmness? I'm going to ask that question, and I might pause and ask another question. What is lukewarmness? It is one who lacks affection or enthusiasm or has no passion. So the second question would be, y'all need to tell me if I'm wrong, say, Pastor, you're wrong. But have y'all seen people lose their enthusiasm for church? Yes, sir. 
Yes, sir. They've lost their zeal. They've lost their affection. And let me let me say this. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna blame it all on the pandemic. It was happening before that. But the pandemic has made it worse. I'm talking from what I see. Um, so what, what, what are some of the characteristics of lukewarmness? Let me go down the list. Lukewarmness, those who do not appear committed to Christ. It's hard to find commitment now. People are not committed in their marriages. They're not committed to the occupation. They're not com young people are not committed to, to uh, school. It's just hard to be committed to something now. We've, we, I, I know of people that will go purchase something. Let's say they go purchase a vehicle. Already knowing before they sign it that they're not going to be committed. So those who do not appear committed to Christ. The next one, those who may occasionally attend services. See, I, be, I have become a straight shooter in the last couple of years. And it is a fact that some people, even before the pandemic, was treating God any kind of way. They were occasionally coming to church. But the thing that, 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 uh, that bothers me is, in some cases, these people have reached a certain level in ministry. And the reason they got to the certain level was because of what the man of God seen in them. So he placed them somewhere. And some people, once they get to a certain level, they think that that's it. So they lose their commitment. It's sad that you have uh, uh, ministers and, and deacons and missionaries and uh, leaders of ministry that will attend church occasionally. That's bad. That's a problem. Um, number three, those who are careless in private prayer, Bible study, and self-examination. Some people, if it was not for the church being open on Sundays, they would never pray. There are people that are in ministries that have not picked up their Bible since this pandemic. As a matter of fact, there may be some people that don't even have a Bible at home. They have it on an app. But you gotta have a Bible. You gotta have a Bible. I have several Bibles. You gotta mark them up. You gotta read them. I'm not down in this. This is convenient. But I noticed something on last, the last couple of weeks. I would give out scriptures, and those of you that had the devices didn't get it as quick as Minister Shop with his Bible. So you're, you're careless in your pri private prayer. You know what that means. That means, see, you cannot just pray when you get to the church. You cannot just pray when there's a problem. Man should always pray. You have to pray all the time. And some people think you got to do flips and do spooky things like candles and all that at home before they pray. See, there's a, there's a difference between spiritualism and witchcraft. You got to be careful. You got some crazy folk. <laughs> they think lighting candles and uh, what else? Chanting and all this type thing. No, incense. That's right. So you got to you got to have more of a prayer life now. Now, 
See, I believe prayer can fix anything. I believe it is the church's fault to a certain extent that we're in the, the, the predicament that the world is in right now. Because we've lost the, the, the will to pray and to learn of God's word. I've said this before, but if I was to call an all-night prayer meeting, some people would be saying, what is that? Some people would call me crazy. And you're going to get those same folk to come out that are committed to everything in ministry, which is a handful. There are several churches that claim that they have thousands of members. But how many actually attend? There's a difference what's, that's what's on your row and what's a, what, that, what attends. It's a big difference. So back to that, that's, that's the commitment. The private prayer, Bible study, study to show thyself yeah. approved. See, you got to be careful with that, too, because sometimes you can read something and you don't understand it. That's why you have Bible study. You have to break it down. Some people, I, ha I know of people that have fell off the boat because they read something, and now they think they are uh, uh, prophets and prophetess. God doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. They fell off the boat. Those who are inconsistent in attendance, those who rarely fast and pray, those who never make a sacrifice in giving. Some people, see, when I say that, the audience that I have think I'm talking about money. You understand what I'm saying, Sean? No, 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 no. There are other ways you can give to God. There's other ways. Not only through your money. Although, although you should be a giver. I will say this. People that are givers, I don't care how much money they make, I never heard them complain. I have people that uh, say they make six figures. They don't pay tithe. They don't pay offerings. Don't you know you're on an island by yourself when you do that? Because the Lord giveth. And the Lord taketh away. You can, you can work your fingers to the bone and obtain whatever you want. But are you going to be happy? You cannot leave out God. Too many people think they're doing things on their own now. And they're not. That's why I can say having obtained help from the Lord, I continue until this day. The things that I've been doing the last going on six years, if it wasn't for God, I could not do it. I got to drive that home. I could not do it. I have to tell God, oh, you got to lead me and guide me. You put me here, so you got to lead me and guide me. I got to depend on you. What you going to do when they stop giving you those good government checks? I mean, there's no reason why they can't. You're just sitting home. Sometimes it's a setup. Y'all got to listen to me. It's a setup. Let me show you how I think. If I had 100 employees around here and things weren't getting done, then I say, you know what? Okay, I'm going to close down for a couple of months. But I'm going to keep five. And five of them got done what I needed done. Do I have to bring back the other 95? All right. That's what I'm saying. The government 
or the leaders of the government have to think like that. We can cut back and we can get this done with minimal people. So don't ever forget about God. It is he that gives you the power to obtain wealth. Not yourself. Those who never put themselves to any inconvenience for Christ's sake. Never. You can ask them, can you come and pray? Can you go with me to witness? Ah, oh, no, I, got, uh, I already got something planned. Already got something planned. See, I'm getting ready to go another way. Some people are so insignificant in ministry now. They don't even know it. I'm going to show you later on. Insignificant. And, and I, I, can't, I can't say this, but I can say what I feel. In certain cases, I feel it's over for them. Only God can bring them back. Mm. Talk about commitment and insignificance. Um, a person that is committed whether they know it or not, they're making themselves significant because of the attention to detail that they give to whatever it is that they uh, have been called to do. You know, you're, you're not just showing up for the activity, but you're actually showing up for God. We, all, of us come, all of us can come to church, and anybody can go to church, but is the purpose of you going there just so that it can be said that you were there? There has to be a deeper meaning behind me just coming into this building three, four times a week. My commitment has to be deeper than to just, quote unquote, a ministerial staff or the usher board or whatever capacity I'm working in. The commitment has to be to God. And when the commitment is to God, it doesn't matter how you feel. It doesn't matter what's going on in your life. You talk about being inconvenienced. I'll make my life inconvenient for the sake of God than rather, you know, God for the sake of satisfying the flesh. Because we, 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 we cannot be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God and expect for God to treat us um, the way that we want to be treated. You know, I want all these blessings and all these miracles to come from him, but I'm treating him like he doesn't matter or like he's just another person. And we're talking about the creator of all things, the one that if it wasn't for him, I would not have even opened my eyes on this morning. My, nothing in my house woke me up. It was, it was him that woke me up. And you know, I, I show my appreciation through my service, my time, my tithe, my talent, my life's commitment to him. And if I am committed to him, I am going to do right by my pastor and my church. And that's, that's where love comes into play. Like you mentioned it um, in, in the first place where the church in um, Revelations 2, and he said, you've lost your first love. Mm. Like when you fall out of love, love makes you want to do something for somebody without even asking. And even when you can't do, like even if the opportunity to give is not there, love makes you hurt at the fact of not being able, able to. That's right. to to love or to give and like when you don't if you don't care about who you're serving if you don't care about God like you did in the beginning that's the fade away that happens like you you forget what he's done for you you forget how much you actually appreciate it i think it was when 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 God was talking to the tribes of Israel he gave everybody else a piece of land or a plot of land, but he turned to Levi and said, the Lord is your portion. In that very statement, he made Levi richer than all his brothers. Mm -hmm. He said, the Lord is your portion. And if you get to a place where God is your portion, you reach a place of contentment that's like, yeah, the other stuff will come as it, as it pleases him, but then your life at that point 
becomes a faith exercise. It's not even a matter of you getting something because you need something, because you got everything. If you would attain any other level, it becomes a faith exercise after that. But until the Lord becomes your portion, you're going to be empty for the rest of your life. You know, you know, Pastor, you brought up a valid point a few minutes ago when you said it is our fault. Is the, the world is not the fault of the condition of the church. It is, the, it is, the, it is our fault. There's two things that were mentioned here. The first one, you cannot do anything <clears throat> completely give yourself to anything without passion or without love. Once love is gone, and definitely when passion is gone, you're stuck in the middle of a river with nowhere else to go. When we, when we look at the lukewarmness that God said, and this was what God said about the church, he said you're neither hot, you're neither cold, but you're, but you're lukewarm. And he said this is what the church has said to him. He said because you said out of your mouth, Thou says, I am increased with goods. Look, I am rich, and I have need of nothing. And it, it, is, it is so amazing how that we have become so carnally comfortable and so spiritually dead. Due to the fact that, um, you, know, you know, when we look at the, when we look at the church world, when we take a, a good look at it overall, once... It, any religious organization, I don't care if it's Pentecostal, Apostolic, um, Lutheran, Catholic, you know, even the world can look at it and say, and once we start compromising what we believe in and what the truth says about the Bible, and then we start relying on this flesh and pleasing it in all kinds of ways with, with the, look, with the lack of, you know, we, we take, yes, it's, it's true that God can give us the world. Yes, he can give us the house the, upon a thousand hill. He, he has tre hidden treasures that we know nothing about. The, the problem is the one thing that we forgot, and our pastor taught us, our apostle taught us, he said, when thou art eaten and art full, that thou shalt not forget the name of the Lord thy God that have brought thee. And that's where the problem is. Once, once the church world start compromising, and how are we compromising? We putting things over top of God. And once we get satisfied, we don't feel the, I, I tell you what, become a millionaire, the first thing you're gonna do is quit the job that got you there. You don't want to, you don't, got to, you don't feel the need to get up at six o'clock in the morning no more. Or that urge to push once you become satisfied. Say for instance, you don't, you don't feel the need to. Like, say for instance, when there is no trouble, there is a lack of prayer. You know, when your pockets are full, you, why would I pray for food when my pockets are full? I don't need to pray for it anymore. The only time it becomes important again is when you only got two pieces of bread and a bottle of water in the refrigerator. Little do you know, storms are coming, and they're hitting out. And you know, out of all of these things, now you know, like say, friends, something's got to happen. A falling away has to happen. The one thing you don't want to be is the person that's that's falling away. Um, people are backsliding left and right. That's the one thing you don't want to be is the one person that's in that number. You know, Jesus is coming. And he kept telling us, he gave us these signs and gave us these warnings that, that in the last days, men shall depart from the faith. Lukewarmness. And this pandemic, as Pastor just stated, it's, it's the Bible said it in these point, if it was possible that he would be able to fool the very elect. And then if the righteous gonna scarcely make it in. So Whatever high horse that we think we're on, we definitely need to get off of it. No matter, and that, that's from the pulpit all the way back down to the back door. You, you think you're that strong, you, you think prayer is not necessary no more. And my God, we're in, we're in so much trouble. We're in, a lot of, we're in a lot of trouble here. And I don't think we're in, it's, it's, it's hard to, 
you know, it's hard for a, a man to see that he's in trouble when, when, he, when, he, when he got everything. And the problem is, we got to continue to fight. We got to continue to push. Um, and, and the only way that we're going to get back is going to be through the pulpit, Pastor D. I, I feel that the, on, that, that the answer to this lukewarmness that we're having right now, the answer has got to come from God through the pulpit. That's going to be the only way we're going to get back. And we are definitely, if I'm talking about the church world, we are we're in trouble. We are in trouble. Let me give a couple, couple of more characteristics. Those who never abandon any comfort for Christ's sake. Those who never braved any reproach for Christ's sake. This is the big one here. Those who dabble into sinful pleasures of life. Lukewarmness. These characteristics are contrast to real Christians. Being real Christians means we take the things of God seriously. And we seek to follow Christ and his teachings. We must make a clear difference of the things in us. Matthew 10 and 38 says, and he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. Luke 14, 27 and 28, and whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. John 13 and 35, by this all will know that you, you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Being lukewarm is something that is not favorably examined in the scriptures. Revelations 3 and 16. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich, I have become wealthy, and I have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Generally, the lukewarm Christian has one foot in the church and the other in the world. That's a big mistake for John. First John 2, 15 and 16 says, do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And Pastor, that, that scripture in Revelation that you read that, say, that stated, because you say I'm full, and need nothing. Mm -hmm. I'm clothed, but you're really naked. I think that brings light to the, there's, there's a such thing called um, false faith. Like you can have a false faith, it's a counterfeit faith. If there is no struggle, if there's no cross in your believing, there's no struggle at all where you can do all these things and still say without even a thought in your head, oh, I'm good. I'm saying, and there's no struggle. Like, even on my best week, even on my best day, I'm like, Lord, did I? You know, and I think, um, I, and I read in Genesis where I think it gave the best allegory for this scenario where um, who, who was, it was Isaac's wife that was struggling with twins. And she said, what is this going on in me? And God said, you got two nations on the inside of you. And each and every believer has two natures mm -hmm. on the inside, constantly fighting against one another. You got the old man and you got the new man, constantly duking it out every single day. And if you don't feel that tension, I don't care how good you're doing in God. If you don't feel those two nations going to battle, a, somebody's dead somewhere, like a baby's dead. Like, and, it's, and that's not a real feeling, because he said in Revelation, like, for you to feel like you're all good, 
and not feeling no loss, no need for anything, that's not a real experience to be in life. That's not, that's not a reality. You can have a false faith and that false faith will lull you closer to closer to sleep. And no one never comes to the altar if you don't feel like you don't have a need. So the enemy will slowly lull you to sleep, making you feel as though there is no problem, you are perfect, and the world is fine. See, Mr. Saudi, what happens in that situation? People are taking advantage of God's grace. That's it. Christians have gotten spiritual amnesia. You can't take advantage of God's grace. Some people say, oh, God understand. No, that's taking advantage. You can't do that. That's bad. Lukewarmness of spirit in your Christianity is a dangerous one. Titus 1 and 16. They profess to know God, but in works they deny him. Being abominable, abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. When you're lukewarm, did you hear what I just said? Disqualified. So it don't matter what you did good. You're going to get disqualified. Lukewarmness is a dangerous thing because the persons involved sometimes are unaware of it. All right, let me break it down. Think of it like this. If a person is sick and does not know that he is sick, he is in great danger of his life because he is not at all likely to take proper care of himself. They think they okay. That's what it's saying. You think you're okay. I don't need nothing. I got everything I need. I don't got to go to church. I don't got to pray. I'm fine. A lot of times when you come doing, doing certain things as a habit, it's almost like I praise God. Um, I'm shouting. I'm speaking in tongues. But is it the real tongues or is, the, is God in it? Because it's almost like you can learn something and you're not going to lose it. So it becomes a habit and God has walked away from you, so, but yet you think that you're still connected to God. And I think that's what happened a lot of times. We think just because we come in here and we will shout, or we just, uh, we in the pastor's face, that we're doing good towards God. But God said, how are you treating the pastor? You know what, what that is? You came here, you just got a power surge. Show you what I mean, because I, as the pastor, have came here and didn't feel like shouting or praising God. But then, sometimes when everybody else is doing something, people get that. Oh, I got it. That's a power surge. But when you're connected, when you're at home all by yourself, mm, yes, my when you're connected, you can be in your car. Yes. Mm -hmm. When you're connected, you can be on your job. Doesn't matter where you are. You're connected. I'm tired of these power surge. Saints. It, it shouldn't happen every service. That condition oh, no. that you're referring to. No, it to, shouldn't. I mean, every, like, we may not feel like giving God praise or whatever in, in not all the time, but it should be more that I feel like doing it than I don't. You don't have a choice. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. We think we have a choice to praise God. No, you yeah. don't. Yeah. You, so we I, are commanded. Yeah. To praise him. It, 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 it reminds me of Elisha. When, when Elijah laid his mantle on him, mm -hmm. he said, oh, I'm burning everything because I'm never coming back to this place. That's right. So when I get on board with God or when God allows me to become a part of his life, now, like you said, I have no choice in the matter. I'm not going back to what I used to be. I'm not going back to be a sinner. I'm not. I'm going to do everything to press forward so that I won't fall, fall away. So that, I, so that I won't drift away from him. Um, and again, that, that goes back to commitment and not forgetting the things that he's done. See, Sean, the reason why we feel like that sometimes is because we're human. <laughs> so it is in the natural. It is in the spiritual. But listen, when your pastor 
or a praise team leader makes a declaration, everybody praise them, you gotta praise them. See, you don't know. Maybe whatever you're going through, when you start praising him, he'll bring you out of it. People got to get that in their head. They got to understand that. You got to understand that. Some people say, oh, that ain't real. They just, no. You got to praise him. And then see, the, 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 ah, the question is, what is your definition of a real praise? That's the question. Praise is not a feeling. Mm. Praise is acknowledging That's who right. you are. And people go based on a feeling. I don't feel nothing, so I can't praise you. But when I look at all that God has done for me, I have no other choice but to praise him. That's right. You're praising him. That's right. Not man. That's right. I'm praising God. Because if he take any of your limbs from you, you won't have the limbs to praise him. Mm. But as long as you have breath in your body, I don't care what you have, you got to praise God for who he is. And that's that relationship. And that's why people are lukewarm because they have no relationship. They feel like the relationship is when you come into the house of God. But that relationship is at all times. And the Bible said, pick up your cross daily. That's every day you got to think that I have to, I'm, my work is for God. It's not about me. It's about God. So every day I'm struggling. Yes, I'm going to fight every day just to make it into the kingdom of heaven because he died for me. I want to live for him forever. And it's, it's a sacrifice too. You know, it says, you know, we have to sacrifice, come with the sacrifice of praise. It's not something that, you know, is determined upon your situation, circumstances, or how you, like you said, how you feel. When we come into the presence of God or we're trying to enter the presence of God, you got to sacrifice a praise. You got to give it from your innermost being and allow God to take over after that point. Whatever you're going through, whatever struggles or things that's burning you down, you, that's when you give it to God. But, you know, people try to go a different direction and they take the Samson mindset on how they're going to handle things. They play and dilly and dally with the world and allow Delilah to deceive them and get them into things. And then when they, you feel like when it's time to put on God or show for God to show up, they shake themselves and there's nothing there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the command to praise should not frustrate a believer. Like, it, I think sometimes we get caught up in the personality that's saying do it or that's giving the command and that needs to, you need to move past that. Mature, mature saints can move past that. I get it sometimes. Um, that you could have an altercation with somebody and then that person is the very one that's leading the service. Mm -hmm. Well, in order to get what I need from God, I got to get past you and know that it's bigger than me in order for me to give God the praise that he's due from a pure heart and be able to receive whatever it is that he has in store for me from the service. So, you know, look past the personality that's telling you to do whatever it is that is uh, required in the service and give God what he's worthy of. The situation illustrated in Revelations 3, and 3, 16 and 17 is if he or she who is neither cold nor hot but thinks they are spiritual and full of love is not at all likely to do anything for improvement of his spiritual condition. A Christian who is lukewarm sees salvation not only in the church of Christ but any church or body of people calling on the name of God. They think everybody, oh, that, they, they can go in any church and think that, that everything is okay when you're lukewarm. But when you're not lukewarm, you have, uh, what you call it, discernment. Mm -hmm. Something ain't right in here. You, can, you gotta understand. Everybody ain't right. Being filled with the Spirit gives the Christian fullness of assurance and satisfaction of the will of God. Obviously, the doubtfulness and uncertainty feelings as to whether you are right with God, together with an unwillingness to closely examine yourself, often arises from lukewarmness. 2 Corinthians 13 and 5. Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves? that Jesus Christ is in you, 
unless indeed you are disqualified. A person that is lukewarm, James 1 and 8 says, he is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. The proud, I'm sorry, the uh, Laodicean church was proud instead of being ashamed of their lack of enthusiasm for God. Spiritual aloofness is not a virtue. Spiritual riches, not physical riches, are proof of heavenly approval. Matthew 19, 24 and 25. And again, I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. When his disciples heard it, they were greatly astonished, saying, who then can be saved? <laughs> Christ wants us to know that a congregation may be attractive and impressive by world, worldly standards and still be as dead as a doornail. Mm. They attractive. Go ahead, Mike. I'm thinking about how God you know, operates all through the Bible. Um, even from the beginning, God has always been a progressive God. He's always been trying to move things forward and looking for people who are willing to progress his message, to progress his message of love and, and bring people to him. And, you know, when we fall short of that, we fall short of that by falling after the things of the world and going away from God, moving away from God by trying to follow after the things that are not of God instead of trying to unify as they did in Acts. When they came together, it was a progression. It was, it was, a group of people that came together and they waited for God to give the instructions. And that's why when you said pray, you know, you can't go and do anything without the, the, in the purpose and the path that God has for you until you pray and get the instructions. That's right. and, and people nowadays don't want to get the instructions because they're going to be in opposition to their selfish, lustful desires. And, and, and the problem with that is when you pray to God and ask him for instructions, what are you looking for? You, he, could, he could give it to you through a sermon. You gotta understand that. But you're looking for something to be like grand. Like, that's why people all of a sudden say, well, God told me to do this. Because nobody can question God. God told me to do this. God told me to do that. And, and that's a real mark of that carnal part that James was talking about, a double-minded man being unstable in all his ways. I think he continues in the next verse saying, they are tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. Mm -hmm. Like when there is no, when, when, you're, when, when you're settled in God and you're anchored, this is what we believe, right? But then you start adopting, when you start adopting the, it doesn't take all of that, or mm. I can do it this way, or I pray at home or, you know, all these other things where I got another way of doing it, right? You got all these different winds of doctrines, like this is not what we believe. And like you said before, you can walk in any church and it'd be fine. You can walk in this sure. church, they're preaching this. And like, you're cool with just about anything being said, unless it's God in the front of the sentence. <laughs> you have no discernment of spirit because any spirit can move you. Mm. You're that double-minded, you're being tossed and fro by, any doctrine somebody throw out there, you say, yeah, that sounds cool. Any spirit that's, yeah, that sounds about right. You're not anchored anywhere. And that's why we can never find you when we need you. Mm. The danger of self-deception makes some members to be neither cold nor hot for the things of God. Self-deception. The Laodicean church thought they were rich and had no need for anyone. But Jesus Christ said in Revelation 3 and 17 again, because you say I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. They didn't know it. Self-deception. They didn't know it. They were messed up. It's amazing in that passage, God used 
what they used against them. Is the very thing you use as a measuring stick to um, kind of say where you are spiritually, I'm going to use that very thing to show you that you're, you're not where you're supposed to be spiritually. You say, I'm all these things, and those are all physical traits. And God used those same um, physical descriptions to, sh to show them that you are actually suffering spiritually. And that's a terrible condition to be in, but if we, play, if we pay close attention, just like with the description you gave of, you know, like the, the affluent churches and they have all of these things that seem to be going on, but behind the scenes they may have nothing going on with God. It's just like Elder Johnson said, by the standards of the world. It looks great, um, it, but it's really smoke and mirrors because your, spirit, your spiritual condition that man is starving to death mm -hmm. because you are prospering in the, re in the regular world. Lukewarmness makes such members to see no wrong. We should balance our spiritual life. Avoid self-righteousness, for God sees us more than we know ourselves. 1 Samuel 16 and 7, but the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at the appearance or at his physical stature because I have refused him for the Lord does not see a see a man as a man is for man looks at the outward appearance but the Lord looks at the heart that's why people get upset when somebody God used somebody else well, wait a minute I've been around long enough why he ain't using me he know your heart he knows your heart I can say that as a pastor. Well, why he didn't do this, move me or do this? Because I'm watching. Got to watch. I've seen so, so many people get messed up because they get placed somewhere, but they didn't have a heart for it. And the only thing they can have, only bad can come out of it. And Pastor, with that, I think it's good to mention that that scripture is not an indictment on man. It's a statement of fact. Mm -hmm. It said, man's look at the outward appearance, God looks at the heart. That's a statement of fact. I, I've heard that quoted as if, you know, they're, they're using that to say somebody misjudging them. But the reality is all we have to go off of is what we see. Mm -hmm. God tells us, judge a tree by its fruit. What you do tells me what you are, not what you say, right? So. All he's saying is that man's limitation is but what we can see physically, but God knows the heart. That's why the psalmist said, search me, God. Like, you got to put yourself under the microscope of heaven and ask God to search you. Like, what we're talking about tonight, the scripture that says, to, them, to him who thinks he stands, take heed, lest he fall. Like, even if you think you okay, you got to put yourself under the searchlight of heaven. And let God reveal to you the stuff that you can't see. You can't see that. Let God do it and he'll reveal it to you so you can change it. But if you're going off of what you see in the mirror when you wake up, you're missing it. Christ told the lukewarm church that they were blind. This is, a da this is dangerous that a church does not know her spiritual condition. Lukewarmness stops members from seeing their spiritual condition and true nature of Christianity. Finally, the danger of eternal condemn condemnation. Revelation 3 and 16 says, I will vomit you from my mouth. Revelation 22, 11 and 12 says, He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. Everybody is going to get a reward. <laughs> the problem is, that the lukewarm person is going to get an undesirable reward if they remain unrepentant. If 
if lukewarmness is to be eradicated in a church or congregation, each member must take personal action. Examine yourselves. Nobody knows you like you. I mean, I can assume, <laughs> but I don't know you like you know yourself. It is so easy to be religiously complacent. So we must repent, make a decision, and renew our commitment to the Lord. Lukewarm Christians. Lukewarm Christians. Got to repent. We got to turn from that. We got to get back like we used to be. Where you had, you had uh, enthusiasm to get to the house of God. Where you would bug the preacher or the pastor, pastor, let me do something. Let me do something. Let me do something. Where in some cases you would do it and somebody had to slow you down. That's all out the window now. It seems like everybody's for themselves. And I want you to know, if I can see it, God definitely can see it. And what, one, what, one, one word of warning, what, what I've learned is, people are quick to see your faults, but they can't see their own. So somebody got to cry loud and spare not. <laughs> Let you know, ho, 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 ho. No, no, no. That's why we all got to repent. We all got to repent. That's why, that's why it's so hard, you know, when, when, you, when you have to, when somebody has to be corrected and the person doing the correcting is just as bad. See, there has to be a, 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 certain, a certain determination, a certain a way a person is. See, it's hard when people know you. That's why I suggest to a lot of people, I said in a lot of my sermons, be careful who you associate with. Suppose, suppose you're associating with somebody, y'all doing whatever, y'all whatever. Then all of a sudden, you have to be their leader. Then you got to make a decision. You either gonna give them a pass or you got to correct them. The problem is when you go to correct them, remember this: they gonna go over to that closet door and open it. That's what they gonna do. Now, if you're not, if you're not divinely placed by God, you are gonna have a problem. You gotta understand, you're gonna have a problem. You gotta be careful. You gotta be motivated. You gotta have zeal, you gotta have enthusiasm. You gotta be like right now, I, this is just me talking, I'm talking for myself. If my pastor said, you can come out on Thursdays. I'm gonna leave it right there. If if church started at eleven o'clock, and you're on a choir, you're you're a minister, you're a deacon, you're a praise team person, why you get here at eleven thirty? Comfortable. And what happens is, you begin to make excuses. I give you a pass one Sunday, but every Sunday, I can't give you a pass. You, you've lost it. You've lost your zeal. And the, the, the thing about it is, people might be saying, well, Pastor, you don't know what I'm going through. But the only one that can fix it is Jesus. You got to come to the house of God. He's the only one that can fix it. You can't fix it on your own. If that was true, it'll be fixed by now. 
You gotta understand that. It would be fixed by now. You got to, sometimes you gotta give to God and you gotta keep moving. And people need to, they need to ask, that's some certain prayers. See, we gotta stop praying for more money, a better job, a bigger house, a better car, and start praying for spiritual things. That's right, Lord. Give me discernment. Lord, keep me anointed. Lord, wisdom. That's right. That's right. And when you do that, all the other stuff will come together. It's like a puzzle. When you first start with a puzzle, it looks so confusing. But once you get certain pieces together, you will have, ah. And you look at the box, the picture. See, you ain't have, you don't got no business trying to take a, a, a triangle and put it in a circle. Something's wrong. That's what you're doing with your life when you try to fix it on your own. You're trying to put pieces together where they, they're not supposed to be. And ultimately, I've seen it over and over again. After you try to fix it, then you got to come back to God anyway. Lord, please fix it. right sometimes we do things to ourselves mm -hmm. that's why there was a song that says starting all over again it's going to be rough and tough <laughs> but we're going to make it it's going to be rough and tough i don't want to go back to where i was 10 years ago no i don't want to go back to where i was 20 years ago God is a progressive God. He's moving. He's moving. And my job and you all's job is to try to catch him. And this is the thing. When you do those things, when you become lukewarm, when you become uh, uh, um, unenthused, lose your zeal, have you ever been jogging with somebody or walking with somebody and you tell them go ahead I'm gonna sit right here for a minute that was happening with, that's what's happening now people are saying okay God I know you're good and everything but I'm gonna sit right here for a minute and God is gone you, he's out of your view you can't catch him it's like you on a a, a, a treadmill you're running in place. You ain't going nowhere. When you're lukewarm. It, it, see, my first statement was, if you really look at that, that scripture, Revelations, God said, look, either you're going to be for me, or you're going to be against me. How the cold? I don't want no folk in the middle. At least when I know you cold, I know where you stand. But when you're in the middle, you're trying to fool somebody. And you ain't fooling me. I'm talking about God. You're not fooling me. I already know. It seems like, I want to be, let me say it like this. I want to be like a bottle of wine. The older it is, the better it gets. And I don't drink, y'all. No, I don't. I'm just using that. So what, as a Christian, the more that, I, the longer I've been saved, I want to get better. I don't want to have to start over. Can you imagine if you got all the way to the 11th or 12th grade and they said, well, we got to put you back in kindergarten. Now, see, y'all laughing. But let's take that analogy and look at Christendom now. Some people have almost, they're on the brink of graduating, messed up in their senior year, and now they got to start all over again. Man, I'm telling you. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. See, you would think when you become a, a, a minister, a deacon, a missionary, that you've, you've graduated from some spots, some place. But deacons, they're supposed to know the mystery, the 
question is, if you don't know what the mystery is, you got to ask somebody. Maybe you don't understand what the mystery is. That's, that could be part of the problem. You got to know what it is. Missionaries, man. If, if it was like it, it was, some things, I, 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 the old stuff is good. You would have, you would have a, a better class of Christian. See, now people think that they don't need, they don't need a pastor. They don't need no leaders. They don't think they need it. They think they can do it all by themselves. If that was the case, Acts wouldn't have never came around. And this is the thing. People got to see, you got to know the dispensations. We're in grace now. We're in grace. So people try to, some things they try to mix with the Old Testament. It's not for us. You gotta understand that. If that was the case, I will ask all the brothers to go out back and let's kill some deer. We need a, a sacrifice to get right, to repent. Now, if we go back there and kill a deer, somebody's going to eat it. We ain't sacrificing it. That's right. Some people want to live in the Old Testament when it's, what, uh, conducive to what they want to do. I'm trying to tell you. That's what they want to do. That's right. But no, we, 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 we in, we in, in, in grace. And it's getting ready to run out. It's getting ready to run out. We're so close to the rapture. That is funny. Not funny. Well, I should say not funny. Because after the, at the end of the third chapter, the church is gone. But we're going to feel the effects. And I want y'all to know right now, I'm feeling the effects of the Antichrist. All this stuff with vaccines and all this, that's the effect. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. Something is wrong. If you think about it, why all of a sudden now it's 94% working? I was taught what they taught me. Let me say they. It takes two years, five years to develop a vaccine, even if it's on the fast track. All of a sudden, it's ready. We're going to put this in. We're going to get it through. We're going to have 50 million vials this year. Vials? Is it vials? Is that what they call it? Vials. And by next year, we'll have 1.5 billion. They keep showing you this stuff on TV. And, and, and you see, this is the thing. This is the thing. OK, I'm going to be with I'm going to come down to, to, to your level. We believe everything they say, but do we believe everything God says? How do we? Some people, they say, oh, da, da, da. no, do you believe what God says? Don't get me wrong. The reason that some of you all are in here in mass is because I have to obey the laws of the land. You understand that. But do you believe what God says? I'm tired of quoting scriptures just to quote them. I'm going to be honest with you. Growing up, I heard other folks say it, so I said it. But now I know for myself. You got to know it for yourself. Because there's going to come a time when something comes into your life that you're going to have to know it. That's why the Bible says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against thee. You got to have it. I, never remember, I always tell this story. I remember, I remember my dad used to say, just get one. Keep it in your, in your mind. Get one. That's right. And this is the thing. Some people want to be so theological correct that they want to say they're, 
scriptures or scriptures in every version of the Bible. Man, I know old mothers that can't quote it word for word, but they know God. And things happen. You can laugh at them all you want. I remember I used to get sick. My mother and daddy was around, but I used to call grandma. Grandma, I'm sick. What should I do? It seemed like grandma always had an answer. Always. See, people used to laugh at me. I, I remember we used to go out to my dad's mother's house. We used to have uh, gathering like picnics and stuff at her house. They had a lot of land and we used to go. And a, a gnat used to get in, in your eye. You ever had that to happen? And it gets in your eye and the old folks said the reason it hurt is because the gnat pee in your eye. So how do you remedy that? My grandmother would take us over the barrel of fire they had burning and smoke it out. They always had an answer. That's what I'm trying to say. God has an answer. We got to learn how to solely depend on him. Because in the next couple of days, if you don't believe in God like you say you do, you're going to have a problem. I looked at I looked at the news the other day, and I saw over at the stadium where, I mean, the, the, the lines of cars going for food. Now, albeit, some people just greedy. They go to everybody's line. And the reason, the reason why I didn't do anything this year is, one, because of the pandemic. And on last year, we fed the, the senior citizens. St. Paul. But we also ask people if they would like something, call into the office. We prepared 10 baskets for families. Told them it was ready. They never picked them up. You know why they didn't pick them up? Because they didn't have no room in their, in their freezer or their, their refrigerator. Because they went to everyone. But it's going to come a time when they're going to rationalize what you can get. You better believe in God. I'm telling you. You better believe in God. Yes, I know Jesus. For myself. <laughs> you got to know him for yourself. I can't ride off my mother's coattails no more. That's over. I can't. That's not saying I can't say, Ma, pray for me. I can't ride off a coattail. You can't get to heaven off your mother or your father. You can't get to heaven off your pastor. <laughs> you got to get in for yourself. That's what I try to tell the young people. Look, you can't get in off mom or daddy. You got to know them for yourself. So, the question or the answer is, repent and get hot again. That's a sermon. <laughs> repent and get hot again. The worst thing that can ever happen is in the pure winter time, when it's close to zero degrees, and your heat pump or your heater Go out, the flame go out. Some people in church right now, their fire is gone. But they know how to act, so you don't, some people, I got discern. Some people are like, well, they shouting, they speaking in tongues, they running, but their fire's out. You can tell when somebody fires out. The same fire you got here, you got to have it at home. You got to have it on your job. The question would be, if your constituents from your job was to come here, what would they say about you? Young people, if your constituents at school was to come here, what would they say about you? 
that's the weather. I was talking to a, 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 a guy that went to school with me today, and uh, he was, he was, I mean, he was out there, bad, bad. He, he was out there, I mean, out there. God changed his life, turned him around. And he was with another gentleman on the other day, and he was like, they was talking to my brother, and they was like, yeah, you know, he said, yeah, man, I watched his father, man, I, I studied him. He was one of the most powerful men of God in the world. This is how he talked. He said, yeah, and he said, when we was in school, I knew something was different about Clarence. You could tell he was saved. You see, you listen, I've been out of school 40 years. I just heard him say that. And I could have been the cause of him turning his life around. But if I acted with them, and your daddy a preacher, that's right. That's, that goes back to my first statement where it says, uh, uh, oh, Christian, uh, what is it? I cannot become a Christian because of him but people have always pointed at half-hearted Christian. If I was half-hearted, he couldn't say that. And the thing about it was, we was all the same age. I was young, now I'm older. I didn't say old, older. <laughs> so, we gotta, we gotta wake up. We gotta wake up got to wake up. Stop making excuses. If you got a hangnail, come to church. <laughs> See, you're laughing. Some people mysteriously get sick on the weekends when it's time to come to church. But if they work, they get there. Do you know who enabled you to get to that job? Do you know who woke you up this morning? I want to learn more of him. You can never, you'll never know all of him. But you have to want to know more, learn more of him. You should not be the same Christian you were last year. There should be more. You should have more zeal, more something. You should want to see people saved. You should, see, you should want to see people go down in that wonderful name, Lord Jesus Christ. And by the way, I wish they didn't mess me up from last week. That was a good, a good topic. I think we got it fixed, though, and we're going to put it up. Somebody put up the other day, and I know I'm on Facebook, but they don't want you to quote the Lord's Prayer. Huh? They're going to take it down or block your, your page. Oh, yeah. That's right. But you know, it doesn't matter because most, I'm going to say not most, a lot of the Christian folk ain't on there glorifying Jesus anyway. So you probably didn't see it. God gives us tools. Evangelism is different than walking around everybody's house. If you got a Facebook page, shout out your church. Right? That's right. We say happy birthday, happy anniversary. Oh, celebrating my son or daughter's graduation. Why well, we can't push our church? It's powerful. Paul, is it Paul said you got to be crafty? That's right. That's right. Right now, we have about 48, 50 people viewing us. Where are the others? There are some people that of this ministry has never looked at this, and they have Facebook. Something's wrong. When the word of God 
becomes un, you're uninterested in it. You're in the same predicament as the ones that, uh, where is it at? I got to find it because I just said it. There it is. You have become and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. And you don't, you don't have no zeal or nothing for the things of God. Something is wrong. I'd rather see somebody struggling, trying to make it in, than to just do what they want to do in the face of God. That's right. Don't do that. See, there's a difference, man. I'm telling you, there's a difference. It's a difference. How many times do you make mistakes? All the time. I'm glad y'all say that. So let me ask you a question. What do you think God says about if you're making the same mistake over and over and over again? What would he do? to learn from your mistakes. Don't get me wrong. See, a mistake, you did it one time, two times. But when you continuously do the same thing over and over, you have sinful things. You are setting yourself up to become a reprobate. Then, see, and if I'm looking at this lukewarm stuff, you could be headed that way. Because reprobates, their minds has been seared with a hot iron. Just imagine somebody coming up to you, seeing your brain with a hot iron. That's right. So once that happens, you're done. You'll sit right in church knowing ladies that you're going with your girlfriend when you leave out of here. Men, going with your boyfriend when you leave out of here. Knowing that you're going, you're married and you're going with somebody else outside of your marriage. You, your, your mind is seared. And then, you, don't, you think it's okay. See, if the devil didn't come to church, we wouldn't have to do as much as we do. But the devil sets in the church too. The devil will come in here to pull somebody out. That's why we have to be we have to be prayerful, strong, have to have discernment, and have all that. That's why you got to trust your man of God. I'll say this to young people. Don't get in a relationship to the point where you come to me and say, this is the date. You gotta understand that. There's nothing I can do. Because your mind is made up and your heart is fixed. <laughs> you want the blessing of your man of God and each avenue of your life. People might say, ah, well, I, well, I got to tell them this. I'm trying to tell you. I don't care. If you come to me, I remember, I remember going, going to my father several times saying, well, Dad, I want to do this. No, son. Not time. Don't do that. And I went to him, not as a son at that point, I was going to him as a member. Always, always. Because I'm gonna show you the funny thing about, about about Bishop. He used to, you know when something was wrong, 
you ask him a question, it's a certain way he act. <laughs> you, you knew. You, you just knew. If he, you ask him something and he go, I don't know. And hit his, and hit his that's right, I don't know. <laughs> if he said something like this, or he'll he'll ask you the question back. What you think? Oh man, that's a word. <laughs> Are you sure? That's right. He would do that. And people, you know, my mom is sitting over there, and she knows this for a fact. It was to the point where Bishop would tell people that were getting ready to get married or thinking about getting married, I don't think you should. They labeled him as anti-marriage. Then he said, you know what? I'm going to leave it alone. Go ahead. Now, one of the last people I remember till this day, and the person, if I brought him in here, he would tell you the same thing. Came in, said, Bishop, I want to get married. Me and so-and-so want to get married. Bishop said, you sure? You think, you think that's what you want to do? Yeah, because, you know, we, we kind of like, uh, what you call it, we feel each other, you know, we, we, we eat ice cream together. <laughs> Bishop says, ain't going to work. Mock my word. Bishop took, I don't know what he had, I don't know if it was his fingernail, or something he picked up and said, mark my word, scratched it in the wall down in ninth and up. If, the, if, the, if the, the church was still up and I got in there, I can show you where it is. He told them, it ain't going to work. They did it anyway. It didn't work. See, this is the thing. Like, some people... Well, most people, when they come, I ain't even minding your, you know, I'm not minding your business. I don't, you come to me and say something. That's why I got to be like, okay, all right, let me, let me think about it. Let me pray about it. I got to get an answer. You, you got to understand. Sean will sit here and tell you there's something I told you to do. It was the best thing you could have done in your life. I'm telling you. I'm, I wouldn't give you bad advice. I'm not just going to, I don't hate nobody. I don't hate on you. I ain't jealous. Jealous of what? That's what I'm saying. And then you got other people that'll try to learn your ways and try to go do it on yourself. But it don't work like that. Only I can pick this combination. Think about it. I'm trying to tell you. People get mad. I'm trying to, I don't care no more. You get mad because I'm just trying to tell you the right thing to do. Life ain't nothing to play with, man. Why waste time? Have you ever heard people say, man, if I didn't do this, I would be further ahead? That's right. <laughs> Don't, hey, look, your wife said no, both of y'all wives said no, that y'all over here agreeing with y'all. No. <laughs> you gotta be, no, but uh, anything, I'm, I'm serious, anything. There are some things in life that are, are critical decisions. You might not think so. Just because you make the income, sometimes you got to be careful. You know? And I, I, I'm going I'm to I'm 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 say this and I'm going to let you go. I remember my father used to say, I don't know everything, but I got people I can ask. I can say the same thing. If it's real estate, car buying, I can ask. Call them up. Nah, Rev, I don't think they should do that. Okay. Hey, don't do it. Yeah. It's, what, what, what the young people, man, I got connects. Now, I got connects too. <laughs> right? Ain't that what they call it? Connects. That's right. That's what I got. God finds favor in the man of God. I'm telling you, I know that to be a fact, man. I've seen it happen. Uh, 
remember my wife, she was ministering, and she said, we went and got our first house. It was a townhouse. We went and got it. The guy came to the house. The, the guy that wrote it up, the, 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 what you call it, the lender. Got that. Got us the house. How long ago was it after that? About two months. Two, three months after that. Yeah. We went to get her a car. He's setting up in there. And I'm like, wait a minute. We walk in, hey! I'm like, you got a twin? Never forget, my father, when he purchased his house, there was a president of the bank and another gentleman. Bishop went and said, I want to get this house. It was like, okay, Bishop, we'll, we'll, we'll see what we can do. Bishop, he came back. And, Okay, you got the house. Got it. I mean, y'all, some of y'all seen it. You got the house. Then Bishop said, I want the car. He said, go get it. I declare, if not less than a year, I couldn't tell you where that man is now. After Bishop got all that, he's gone. I don't know. I couldn't tell you. This is the thing you got to understand, though. The bank, that bank, the bank that Bishop was banking with, when I was a little boy and couldn't see in the teller window, turned him down. He went to this person, didn't have a relationship with him for no more than six months, and they gave it to him. Favor. That's favor. Sometimes money don't mean nothing. Favor. I'd rather have God's favor. Favor gets you in places you ain't supposed to be. I'm trying to tell you. Yeah. You want me to come up there? That's right. I'm done. I'm finished teaching. But please, let me say this to Scripture Cathedral. Wake up. I preached a sermon three weeks ago, four weeks ago. Sleeping saints. It's time to wake up. All I'm doing now is I'm trying to pinch you to wake you up. Next time I'll slap you. <laughs> or throw some cold water on you. No, I'm, 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 I'm being funny, but seriously, we need to wake up. We need to wake up. I mean, everybody, you know, and I'm not doing this to you, John, but I hate when I'm talking or ministering. And uh, I'm not saying you, you got to, don't, because some people get offended if they think I'm talking. But somebody that I know God is directing me that way, and I'm saying things, and they go, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like it ain't them. They do that. Sometimes it's better to just look and don't say nothing. I'm not saying you. I see your eyes. No, I'm just using that as a reference point. You know, like. I'm telling you, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. It's you. Thou art the man. <laughs> I'm done. Don't forget Sunday, Miracle Communion, 11 o'clock, right here at the Scripture Cathedral, 7610 Central Avenue in Landover, Maryland. Um, if you need directions or information, dial in 301 333 5300. If you get an answer service, go to extension 202 and leave your name and number. Somebody will get back with you. Or you can go to our website, uh, which is www.scm.church. Um, Miracle Communion. And let me say this. You know, some people say, y'all having communion? Yes, we are doing it safely. Um, you get your own. You get your own cup. You get your bread and you get your wine. You open it. You take it. The deacons will hand it to you with gloves on. So you don't have to be scared. God has made a way. God will provide. Um, 
So let me go. Thank you all. Thank my audience. Give yourselves a hand. Some of you have been here faithfully. And um, I, I know what you could do if, if, if I'm not good. Don't tell nobody to come. They, did you catch it? But if, if y'all think it's good and it's, 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 doing, it's benefiting you, tell people to come. Um, we can get it the same way you see Sunday morning. We can get it in here. We can get it in here. So I'm done. Y'all ready for that seed offering? I see you pulling out your cash app, Saudi. What you want to give tonight? $20. Okay, everybody give $20. Saudi said it. <laughs> Not Simon said, Saudi said. $20. Everybody plant a seed of $20. $20. Cash app is dollar sign SCM Church. Once again, that's dollar sign, SCM Church. Or you can go to our website, which is www.scm.church, and uh, click on the button that says online giving. Online giving. Let me, um, let me thank our audio and video team. Because even when we didn't have an audience, these, these people were here. They've been faithful. Um, now, y'all need to tell me now, do you, are y'all tired of it yet? No? All right. OK, that's good. Uh, because, you know, I believe the word of God has to get out no matter what. It has to get out. So let me, again, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank my panel. I don't think except for unforeseen circumstances, my panel has always been here, always. And I thank them for that. I don't know, maybe I'll give them an opportunity to teach um, in, the, in the near future. Oh, I know, see, we, see that mic down there? Anybody got any questions? Anybody? Nobody? Okay. Must mean I teach pretty good. Hey, I'm, I'm gonna say like they used to tell me in school, there's no such thing as a stupid question. No such thing. You know, I, I think sometimes we don't want to ask it because we think it's stupid, but it could be something that could save somebody else's life. But thank you, thank you for your giving. Again, don't forget Sunday. And let me say it to you again, because it's still, we still got, what, about a month and a half in this year? And I'm going to stick to my guns. It shall be well. <laughs> Can y'all say that with some enthusiasm? It shall be well. Why? Because everything is going to be all right. Peace.